obviously we're here in Washington, but there was lots of focus back home about Brexit. A deal, a draft deal has been done. There's been some difficulty uh, getting it through the Commons. But broadly speaking, I mean, are you encouraged that there is any kind of a deal at the moment? Is this good news for the economy? Well, I suppose that it's good that we have a deal and that the EU and the British government and the Irish government have agreed on a deal. It's frustrating that Parliament can't seem to make up its mind on it and hasn't been given a chance, really, to vote. But in the coming week, let's hope that they do. I think most people probably feel that this has gone on for far too long and just have the view that, you know, just do it. Do you see, do you see this as being better for the UK economy, worse for the UK economy? Is it possible to make that judgment? Well, I think it's a mistake to try and map any particular deal into precise numbers about whether it's good or bad for the British economy. My view has always been that a decision to leave the European Union in the long run is not likely to have a major impact on the British economy either way. What it has done is provoke a tremendous political and constitutional crisis. And in that, it should be said, in that, you're, you're slightly going against the grain of many other economists and, you know, it's been seen as quite controversial. But I think there's an awful lot of bogus quantification that's gone on in trying to justify positions held quite honestly for other reasons. Including for the Bank of England? No, I'm not, not saying that at all. I think it's very interesting if you look at what the bank has said. They've not forecast what the consequences would be. What they did was to say, what's the worst that could happen? And we must make sure the financial sector is ready for the worst that could happen. That's their job, and they've done, done that extremely well. I wish the rest of government had been as enthusiastic and energetic in getting ready to give the UK a choice between different options. And, and, and now, what is, what is your hope on Brexit? Well, it would be really nice to have to, to be able to stop talking about it. I think everyone is completely fed up with what's gone on. You can't have a parliament that can do only one thing, which is to vote against every conceivable alternative. I've said before, we need a new parliament, and I think we need an election where it's clear which people believe in remain and which people believe in leaving, and whichever parties or coalition of parties obtain a majority in that general election will be able to claim that they have both a public mandate and a majority in the House of Commons to pass the legislation needed to pursue that objective, irrespective of whether that's remain or leave. We just have to resolve this now. And I just find it extraordinary that Parliament cannot bring itself together, even today, to have a vote on the principle of the deal. But that they have to, you know, start passing lots more amendments. This is playing games in the mind of the most, most of the British people. How do you, how do you explain that then? Because most people in Parliament probably believe in Remain. They also happened to vote for a referendum. Uh, Parliament's brought this on itself. And frankly, the sooner we can get rid of this, the better. Okay. I mean, clearly, you know, let's move on to, to what you've been talking about here in Washington, because, you know, that is an issue that, that, that certainly the focus on Brexit in the UK has meant that we're not looking perhaps as much as we might normally do at the global economy. But you I think it's worse than that. I think we're not even looking at the underlying economic challenges for the United Kingdom. We have one of the lowest saving rates in the British economy of any country in the G20, save perhaps for Argentina. We're not saving enough to finance our pensions. We're not saving enough to finance care for the elderly. We're not saving enough to finance investment in infrastructure. And we haven't yet worked out how we're going to be able to produce more money for the National Health Service. These are the big challenges. What do we do about the education of 50% of the population who don't go to college or university? These are the issues that will determine our prosperity in the future, not Brexit. And it's a great shame that this issue has dragged on for so long that we've been distracted from thinking about things which are important, even just for the United Kingdom. Do you, do you understand, though, why people are so fixated on it? I don't understand why politicians have allowed it to drag on for so long, no, and I don't believe there's any support amongst the public for letting it drag on for so long. We need to focus on the real economic challenges, and you know, here in Washington, people are really focused on very different questions. Um, so, so on that, you have been looking and thinking quite a lot about the state of the global economy, and you know, how would you assess where we are right now? 
So I think the world economy is in a, a low growth trap, as I've described it. We've, we have some growth, but it's not enough to get to where we should be or where we thought we would be just before the financial crisis hit. That means that we could be even worse off than we were after the Great Depression relative to our expectations. So this was what the, the financial crisis and the aftermath worse than the Great Depression? Well, not in terms of what's happened to unemployment, no. But the economy has grown more slowly for a longer period than it did for the 20 years after the Great Depression. Now, we've got a bit of time left, but unless we grow pretty rapidly over the next, you know, six or seven years, we will find ourselves in a position where we'll be behind where we were uh, after the Great Depression. And that is a pretty dispiriting outcome. Are we heading for another financial crisis? Well, the honest answer is no one knows. But it's quite sobering to realise that the amount of debt in the world economy, even relative to GDP, is higher today than it was at the beginning of 2007. It's higher now? Yes. And people said, hey, how do we get into this crisis? Too much borrowing, too much spending. But well, we're now in a position where we've got even more borrowing and not enough spending. So the idea that borrowing is going to be the way to regenerate growth in the world economy doesn't seem to me terribly compelling. So how worried are you? Well, I'm not worried that we're going to have a great collapse in the next 12 months, but the point is that we ought to be having aspirations to get GDP back to where we thought it would have been if, if we'd sat having this discussion in 2005 and said, where do we think GDP will be 20 years from now, 2025? Actually, the path we're on is going to be well below where we would have expected in 2005 that we would be able to reach, just based on an extrapolation of past trends. And that was a reasonable expectation. Now, we would require quite dramatically rapid growth, which I think is not feasible, to get to that point. So we really ought to be thinking, how can we restore growth in the world economy such that we don't have to rely on too much borrowing from overseas, and we save more as a country. These are deeper questions which affect everyone. I mean, everyone believes that we need more money for the National Health Service and we need to provide pensions and we need to provide care for the elderly. Uh, but the question is how we pay for it. And we haven't actually worked this out. So you, what, are the, what are the kind of lessons from having actually fought a financial crisis for those who might well have to fight one in the future? So greater cooperation is crucial. And I think that in terms of dealing with uh, financial crises, we are not yet well placed to ensure that if there were a big crisis and the Bank of England had to create lots of money in order to meet the demand for liquidity, could we do it in a way that would mean that we could explain to people and explain to Parliament that we had a framework for doing it that was consistent with the concerns that people might have about bailing out banks. I think we've got to have a, a much more intensive debate about an explicit design of a firefighting facility that Parliament approves ex ante and the central bank then uh, delivers in the middle of the crisis. Is it depressing to you that, you know, you've been banging on about this for ages we're still facing the same problems. One financial crisis later, do you sometimes wonder what it would take for the different countries around the world to actually come together to sort this out? It is depressing, but I think that when problems are bad enough, even politicians have to wake up and deal with it. And I think that, a, although we're not facing you know, high unemployment, a decade or more of very slow growth... <coughs> which is kind of what we're facing. Which is what we're facing, the great stagnation is what is gradually feeding in to political concern, that they can't achieve their own objectives because the money isn't there without faster growth. And I think that just relying on central banks to sort of be active in cutting rates any further, people are beginning to realise now that this can't possibly be the answer. Right. Deep down, we are in a world of extraordinary uncertainty about economic policy, whether it's trade, whether it's what's going to happen in Latin America, population explosion in Africa, the monetary union in Europe, all of these things, there's more uncertainty today than ever before. And these things affect investment right across the world and also in the UK. And so the, the, the outlook sounds a bit scary. Well, one shouldn't 
exaggerate all this. I think there are there are structural problems. We've had low growth for a decade. I don't want us to have that for another decade. That isn't to say we're facing a crisis next week. We're not. But unless we recognize the nature of the problem of the low growth trap, which is that it's not something that's amenable just to another cut in interest rates. People have to accept that. Politicians need to accept that all the things that they are responsible for play into this. They can't just pass it on to the central bank and say, oh, just cut rates and we'll get growth again. It hasn't worked for 10 years and it, it won't work. It was right to cut rates, uh, but it's not enough where we are. We need a much wider set of policies to get out of this.